Hi everyone, uh, sorry for the delay there. Um, now we have uh, Benjamin Mako Hill who will be uh, talking about uh, anti features. Um, that runs till half 11, I think. Now, now I'm on. All right. It was okay? The audio is good? All right. So, um, all right. Well, it's wonderful to be back at DevConf. I was at uh, DevConf 2 and uh, most, I think, of the DevConf's uh, intervening, so it's always good to be back here. I'm not going to talk I immediately about Debian, but I promise I will get there. Uh, um, uh, I'm going to be talking a little more generally about issues in sort of the free software uh, and open source communities, and uh, in particular, I'm going to be talking about anti-feature. So, as way of a sort of brief introduction to me, because I, I, I think I've certainly I've, I've changed a lot since I've been involved in Debian. I'm by day a sociologist and a researcher into the dynamics of free software communities, communities like Debian. Um, at MIT. I, uh, I'm in an interdepartmental program where I'm the creator and the only member between the Sloan School of Management. I still wake up every day and wonder how I ended up in a business school. Um, uh, uh, and the, uh, some of the engineering programs as well. So um, I study how to, use, how, to design technology, how to use technology design to understand social dynamics and online collaborative communities like free software communities and how to use that understanding of social dynamics to design technology better. Um, by night, I'm a sort of uh, a part of a group that's been called a rebel with rather too many causes. Um, a certainly a long time contributor to the Debian project, um, uh, participated in a bunch of other free software projects, and I'm on the board of the director, the bo board of directors of the uh, Free Software Foundation. So as way of a disclaimer and sort of get my biases out there. Um, here's a brief overview of what I'm gonna try to do in this talk. I'm going to first try to frame this sort of exploration in terms of the whole free software versus open source debate. I understand that uh, that's uh, both fraught and tired territory for a bunch of the people in this room, so uh, I hope to do it quickly and to bring something new and, dare I suggest, more constructive and conciliatory than some of the way that that debate's been had in the past. Um, I'm going to try to argue that the principles versus sort of pragmatic, something that's, I think, uh, certainly an argument I'm very familiar with from uh, uh, my time in the Debian project is is basically valid, but that there are ways that the two camps come together that have often been ignored. I'm going to uh, try to argue that there are important practical benefits of freedom and that they're not what we're used to thinking about when we usually talk about open source. Um, I'm going to introduce the term anti-features. Um, I guess I've a little head start on that, um, uh, which is my topic today. And one of the important ways, and I'm going to argue, one of the, an, an important way of talking about the practical benefits of software freedom. And then I'm going to walk through a bunch of examples of anti-features with the goal of providing three things. First, sort of a, a tour <coughs> of, the, of the horrors possible in a world of proprietary software for those of us that are fortunate to have forgotten. I suppose some of the people in this room. Um, and then a discussion by example of what anti-features are and why they exist. And then finally, a demonstration of the fact that anti-features are only possible because users are kept helpless and out of control in a word, unfree. Um, and then um, uh, I, I've given, this, I've given a, a version of this talk before as a, 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 a keynote, so at the risk of sounding a little keynote-y. Uh, I'm going to try to use anti-features to talk about three of what I think are the most important fronts in the broader sort of movement for software freedom. So, all right. Um, with that aside, we'll jump into the debate for those of us who, those of you who have been lucky enough to miss it so far. Um, uh, uh, it quickly boils down to this. On the first hand, there's the uh, on on the one hand, there's there's basically this side, this is the GNU, the GNU head, the Richard Stallman, the Free Software Foundation, who have for the most part uh, spent the last 20 years talking about freedom, uh, about freedom in the Debian free software guideline sense, that is the freedom to use, study, modify, share, and collaborate on software. I don't need to teach you if you're DDs, you've had this beaten into your head uh, uh, repeatedly already. Um, um, but what I can say is that, is that rather than repeating either the Debian free software guidelines or the, or the, the free software, this free software definition, I think I, I can tell you a little bit about how I like to think about it, which is in terms of autonomy and empowerment. And I sort of use a, an anecdote sometimes about a, about a, about a mobile phone. So let's say I want to send a message to a friend back in Boston about how 
uh, about the great view that I had from the 12th floor of my dorm room, which was actually quite nice. Now, I could, uh, if I have a phone that can send SMSs and they have, you know, I can try to type it out there and I'm gonna be constrained in my ability to describe the beautiful view by the 160 characters that I can type in on my phone, right? I could write a poem about it. I could be very evocative, but I'm gonna be constrained, right? Now, if I have one of these phones that can take pictures, which I do, I, I have to figure out how it works, um, but if I can take a picture with my phone and that other person has a phone that can receive pictures, then I can maybe send a picture. And my ability to send a message is gonna be very different. I could call them up on the phone and tell them somewhere. You, you, we get the point. The, 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 the issue is that the, the technological affordances of the, of, of the technology that I'm choosing to communicate right here is determining very explicitly the, the nature of the message that I can say, right? My ability to communicate something to someone in, in Boston is constrained by the technology that I choose to use it. The technology determines very explicitly explicitly what I can say, who I can say it to. They have to have a phone that can receive the kind of message that I'm trying to send. Um, how I can say it, when I can say it, right? The, 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 point, the point is that there's a huge amount of political power for the people who control these technological, who may, are making these technological decisions, who are designing these technologies. And control over that technology is, a very important, is in a very important sense um, uh, a, a type, an type of political control that controls our experience. My ability to experience the world is defined very explicitly by, by my ability to, to control my technology. That's why free software is important to me. The concrete benefits of living uh, of this type of freedom, I guess, include the fuzzy feeling of living in freedom, which we all respect and which no one else seems to understand um, why we think is interesting, and are sort of left at that. Now, on the other, on, on the other hand, we have open source, right? Which was invented as a term to explicitly distance itself from the work of the free software movement and from these freedoms that I've described by emphasizing pragmatic, pragmatic benefits. In, the words, in, in words taken directly from the open source initiative's website, um, it's, it's quote, better quality, higher reliability, more flexibility, lower cost, and an end to predatory vendor lock-in, right? Now, the normal response to that is that that's bad, the free, from the free software side, the Richard, Richard Solomon, I'll be Richard Solomon for a second, says that's bad because we're not talking about freedom. And I'm biased here, as my shirt shows, so that's my response too, at least in some sense, right? Um, I think that freedom really is important and that we should be talking about freedom, but that's only part, or at least, and, and I think that on one level, the least interesting part of my response. Because I also reject what I think is a false dichotomy between these two camps that this debate sets up, right? I believe that practical benefits really do matter um, for a whole number of reasons. Most, most relevant here, I think, that the, the, I think that freedom imparts inherent benefits that have nothing to do with the different methodology. So I think that on the one hand, the free software camp is right to be, talking, to be, to be worried about talking about quality, reliability, flexibility, and cost as an inherent benefit of, free, of the free software development model. And I think it's understandable that, that they don't want to do it um, because I think that on one level it's just demonstrably wrong. I don't know, so who here was using free software in, I don't know, 95, 1995? Okay, like, so, 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 so you remember, it was really, really bad, right? <laughs> Like, like um, the, the, well, I mean, it was, it, it was good in some ways, but it wasn't like, I mean, I, I vividly remember go, get print, printing a list of the three CD-ROM drives that were supported by the Linux kernel. Going to the store, buying one, having it be a new version of, the, of one of the three supported CD-ROM drives and not working, right? The, the inherent benefits weren't there. It crashed more often, it was unstable. I mean, all of these things worked out with time in some ways, right? But, but, but it certainly wasn't inherently better before it was built, or at least built completely, and, it's, when is it, and, and it'll, be done, it'll be done when it's done, right? Um, um, that I think that, the, the, that there was this, that there was an idea very connected to the dot-com boom that we could just throw our code online and people would start fixing our bugs, and uh, it's a nice idea. Um, but I think that the reality doesn't quite work. People, do, people remember Linux Care. Linux Care was a poster child of the dot of, of, of the dot com boom, right? Linux Care became a proprietary software company um, because they they were able to make more money that way. They eventually went into business, so they probably had other problems as well. But um, but, but the, the 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 point is that, that that this idea that this was inherently better didn't quite work out for everyone who did who did it. It turns out that open source is more difficult than just putting your code online, slapping a GPL on it, and just like letting the patches roll in. Um, um, although that's a nice idea. Um, so it, putting my sort of sociologist hat on, if you look at large numbers of free software projects, right, SourceForge, we'll go to SourceForge, we'll look, median number of contributors to a SourceForge project. Any guess? Median number of contributors? One. 
a single person, right? Median number of CVS commits, zero. 95th percentile in terms of, in terms of, uh, in, in, in terms of contributors, five, right? The average free software project is one person doing nothing or very little by themselves. Um, um, and, and even among the successful projects, the projects which have been downloaded thousands and thousands of times, right? Most of the time, and you know this because you've put stuff online and had nobody fix, your, fix the bugs, right? Um, um, the reality is, is, that it's, is that it's a little bit more difficult. The benefits are not inherent to, a free, to, 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 to freedom, and they're not automatic. The benefits of mass collaboration are simply irrelevant for your average free software project, which is an average person working by themselves, right? We can all enjoy the collaborative potential, right? But freedom does lead to practical benefits, even in those situations, always. And these benefits have nothing to do with pragmatic issues of low cost and flexibility, and they have everything to do with freedom. Um, and that's where anti-features come in. I got, I got there eventually. Um, because the world of proprietary software is a world of firms controlling users for their own benefit and very often for users' disadvantage. Um, it's a world where rights and desires of users come after the technology producer's desires for profit and for the desires of a third party friend. We call them a, what is it, a strategic partner. I'm in business school now, so I can um, uh, uh, speak to that, right? A friend for a price, right? Um, the, result is, the result is that non-free software is full of features that users hate. Features users hate so much they're willing to pay, if they're lucky enough to be able to pay, to have those features removed. And I call those features anti-features. Um, so like a feature, an anti-feature must be built. It's not a bug, it's something that requires effort. Um, it's not a missing feature. It's added functionality, but it's negative functionality, at least in the sense that it makes the technology something do something that a user does not want that technology to do. Which brings me back to free software. Because free software gives users control in a, way that I, in a way that I talked about a few minutes ago over what their technology does. And anti-features are a way of designing technology in ways that I, I exploit users quite explicitly. Now when users have control, as they do when they're using a system like Debian, they're given a choice in the matter. And my, in my experience, users given a choice on whether or not they want to be exploited tend to choose not to be exploited. Um, the result is quite simply that anti-features cannot exist in the free world in the long term. Um, in a sense, defense against anti-features represents an inherent advantage, advantage like actually inherent, um, of free software over competing proprietary technologies. And it stems directly from the freedom, not from the development methodology, um, not from the fact that you have lots of people showing up who probably aren't um, to, to, to work on your software. As such, it represents a sort of compromise or middle ground in this debate. In a sense, um, um, uh, so, 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 so now hopefully some of you are thinking, come on, like, well, hopefully, I don't know, I mean, uh, maybe, 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 maybe you, you believe me already, right? F features users hate, what are you talking about? How common could this be, right? And I hope to show you that they are everywhere and that they're an inextricable part of proprietary software business practice and that they're a way that we can think about um, free software and proprietary software and think about um, advocating for, for, for Debian and for free software more broadly. So. Um, I think the best way to explain anti-features is to show you what I'm talking about through examples. And I've broken my examples down into four major types of anti-features based roughly on why they exist. Um, the, the, the first is, um, let's see, so the first is sort of just the, the simplest to explain, so it's where I like to start. Um, and it's understandable to anybody who sort of understands roughly how the, the mafia works. So uh, <laughs> people, people, people from New York or from Italy will understand me here, right? Um, um, uh, 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 so, so selling protection, this is sort of selling protections from, from yourself, right? Uh, it's very dangerous here, maybe uh, you need some protection. Like it's dangerous because you're gonna break my window if you don't uh, uh, pay me off, right? So, so all right, so, so, so who, who here has, I mean, remember these things? Uh, the phone books, right? Um, uh, uh, we used to use them to sit on them, the children would sit on them. Um, but uh, so, so has anyone here ever paid the phone company to not list their phone number, right? Yeah, yeah, like, I mean, uh, I have, right? Um, um, it usually happens in terms of offsetting costs for other people, right? The idea is that the phone company is gonna print your phone number so that it can call you. I mean, it is more difficult for the phone company to print your number than to not print your number, right, on one level. Um, so so here's, here's how it works, right? Firm A, in this case, the phone company, has a product or service to sell to users. They're gonna, they're gonna um, uh, uh, sell the, uh, they're, gonna, they're gonna give you a phone book, right? Put your, put your name in the phone book. Firm B is willing to pay, um, uh, uh, 
so let's say this is the, mar the telemarketer is willing to pay the phone company and says, hey, great, we're willing to pay you, you know, a, a dollar for, for, or, or 10 cents for each phone number. And this goes on in aggregate, and pretty soon they're willing to pay $50 um, to, to the, the, there are companies willing to pay $50 for that person's phone number. So the phone company says, well, hey, um, this, uh, so the user says, hey, we, I'd like to get my name out of the phone book. But, but of course, your name in the phone book is worth $50 to the phone company if they sell it to other people. So they, so, so they, so they say, great, you pay us $100, and then we won't uh, sell your name to these other people, right? It's, this, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a simple racket, right? It's like uh, uh, we're going to get our 50 bucks one way or another. We're either going to get it from you or we're going to get it from the people who you don't want us to get, to get it from. Wh which one do you want to do, right? Now, uh, let's get a little back to technology. Do people remember Claria or Gator? So, so, so this is a great piece. A Gator was a piece of software installed on 35 million computers, none of which were running Debian, um, uh, uh, all of which were running Windows. And what's kind of funny is, is that, I mean, it was one of the most widely installed pieces of software on Windows. And what's funny is, is that almost no one remembered installing it. In fact, maybe no one remembered installing it. Because Clary was a piece of, because Clary was a piece of spyware. Um, it, I mean, it was like, I mean, this is great. It's like, it's like for those of us fortunate to have forgotten the proprietary software world, it's like core wars. You have, you'd have one piece of spyware, like looking, you know, finding another piece of spyware, like, 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 you know, trying to uninstall it or block it or make it think that it was working, but not. I mean, it's really, really, uh, re really quite ugly, right? But what's interesting is that Clarion Gator was never, was never directly downloaded and installed with anyone. What it was was shipped with existing pieces of software. It was shipped with Kazaa, it was shipped with, um, uh, most famously, and with sort of, bit, and with a, a series of peer-to-peer your clients. Um, it was shipped with um, DivX, the, the sort of not quite DVD, but the, the, the video decoding software, and many other pieces of software on Windows. And it monitored users' web browsing habits, replaced, replaced ads so that you thought you were selling an ad from a website, but you were seeing an ad from somewhere else, and was sort of generally nasty. Um, and this phenomenon, and, and what's interesting about this is that, is that it was being, is that, that a number of these companies, including DivX, offered, offered versions, premium versions of their software. And DivX offered a version of, uh, um, a, a, a premium version of the DivX software, which was, uh, which came, which was small, the, the file was actually smaller, because the only difference between the premium and the non-premium version was that the premium version didn't have the ads, uh, and didn't have the adware. They would not install software on, on, on your computer, otherwise it was exactly the same. Now, this is, th this is, this is a, uh, this is an, an example from Sony. I, I understand you can't read this, so I'll, I'll read it. I'll read it for you. This is sort of like this is basically the same sort of mafia behavior related to, to crapware, except on an even larger scale. This is called. This is a, an option that Sony offered a, a, a year or two ago called Fresh Start. And there are two choices here. This is in the configurator, so you're buying your you're buying your um, your VIO online, and you can choose between no Fresh Start, subtract forty nine dollars, which is kind of an interesting way of thinking about it, or um, uh, Fresh Start. Uh, which is removal of specific VIO applications, trial software, and games. And I'll read this. It says, opt for a fresh start, trademark, on your VIO PC, will under and your VIO PC will undergo a system optimization service where specific VIO applications, trial software, and games will be removed from your unit prior to shipment. Fresh Start safely scrubs your PC to free up valuable hard drive space and conserve memory and processing power while maximizing overall system performance right from the start, right? So, so, so basically, they would just not install all the crapware that they were getting paid. They were getting paid somewhere in the range of about fifty dollars for each PC shipped. Right? It's it's like really explicit. Sony's getting fifty bucks to install a bunch of software that users don't like and want to install, and they're willing to basically take fifty bucks from you in order to not install the software on your computer. And apparently, it was completely necessary. The reviews of the computer that came out where they offered this said that said that the screen blue the blue screen the first time the reviewer turned it on crashed and quote behaved as it was broken um, before the unwanted software was removed. And once they removed all the crapware, it was like great, uh, it worked it worked it worked just fine. Um, uh, Sony relented after getting a ton of negative publicity, although I guess that despite the fact that they've relented the negative, as I am evidence, the negative publicity has not quite stopped. Um, uh, so things are continuing in that sense. Um, but I think that this is a, a, a good example. I mean, can, 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 can we imagine the situation in Debian? Of course not, right? Um, how long would it take for someone to fork it? How long would it take, uh, uh, you know, no, no, no time at all? Here's the second group of anti-features, and these are related to market segmentation. Market segmentation is sort of the polite uh, uh, business school term or marketing term for what other people call price discrimination. Discrimination sounds bad, so we don't like to say that. Um, um, uh, but but, but uh, the people who do it call it price discrimination. And, and I think that the best way of talking about, um, uh, and, and the basic idea here is that, is that people will get 
pe people are willing to pay or able to pay different amounts of money. So if you've, if you've I mean, I forget who said this. I, I mean, I, uh, I apologize to whoever I'm, I'm, I'm ripping off without, uh, without credit. But, but if, 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 if people, they said that if people had a, uh, like the price that they paid for their airplane ticket, like above their seat, that there would be riots on the airplane, right? Um, because because, because you know, people, people are paying an order of magnitude difference for, for seats that are immediately next to each other, right? The idea, the idea, and this is sort of famously that if you stay a weekend, you get the cheaper ticket because, you're, because business travelers never stay weekends and they're willing to spend more. The basic idea here is that different people are willing to pay different amounts. And so market segmentation means can we sell people the same product or a very similar product? Um, uh, at, at whatever price they're willing to pay so we can sort of maximize profits overall, right? Um, but moving back to technology, I think that, that, that uh, I mean, the history of Microsoft Windows can be read as a history of trying to squeeze more money out of people by making their software worse and by forcing people into different segments where they can sort of pay it. And this is my, and this is my, my favorite, this is, this, is, this is one of my favorite anti-features, and this is actually part of what got me thinking about the concept of anti-features fundamentally was the story of Windows NT Workstation and Winto Windows NT Server. Windows NT Workstation 4.0 and Windows NT Server 4.0. Uh, and the story is, is, that, is, that, is that Windows NT Server was, a, these were two different products offered by Microsoft. Um, one of them, and this was sort of in the early days of the, of, of the internet, and people were beginning to want to run servers, basically, on their systems. So, 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 so Microsoft released a new version, uh, released two versions of NT, one of which was sort of capable of running on servers, and one of which was, was more uh, ready for, for, for workstations. And they described them as two very different products intended at two very different functions. Microsoft claims that, that the server was suited and tailored for use as an internet server, while NT Workstation was, quote, grossly inadequate. Um, and aiming to uh, enforce or reflect this difference, um, the, the uh, Workstation code and license agreement restricted users to, to no more than 10 concurrent TCP IP internet connections. Uh, so NT Server could have as many as you want. So NT Workstation could only make 10 concurrent TCP IP connections, right? Now, now, some people, some, a journalist at O'Reilly and a number of people noticed that other than this difference, they really acted pretty similar. In fact, they were very, very similar. In fact, someone um, noticed that all of the files that were present in NC Workstation were also present in NC Server, and that they were the same size. And in fact, if you MD5 them, they were actually had the same MD5 sums. In fact, they were, exact, they were extremely similar. They were exactly the same software. Um, uh, uh, eventually, someone realized that there was a single registry flag um, set by the installer, um, which, which, which um, would say, I'm a workstation. And if you were a workstation, it would invoke code present on both workstation and servers, which would, which would arbitrarily limit the number of connections to 10 TCP um, connections. That, that, that systems would, um, that there was software that would start up, um, I forget, the, the IIS would start up as IIS on Windows NT workstation, but on, on server, but would start up as a, a personal, personal web server somewhere else. Um, the software was, ident was identical. Um, someone at Microsoft, I mean, not just someone, a team at Microsoft, job was to build a set of features which would, which would, which would restrict people which would, and, and, at enormous expense, right, to Microsoft, to, to, to limit people. You know, the, this is a great product, and, and it's quite, you know, to limit people in ways that clearly nobody wanted. Nobody said, you know, I really like NT workstation server, but the problem is I just, you know, it just allows me to make too many too many concurrent TCP connections. I really want the, uh, uh, you know, I, I really want one that's, that, that's not. But Microsoft saw this as a way of minimizing their costs while sending as many people into the more expensive products as well. It was an $800 difference between the two products. Um, um, uh, and, well, and people were thrilled about this because all the, once, as soon as people realized it was a single registry flag, you could flip one bit on your computer and you, and, and you could have an $800 upgrade to your software. Um, uh, but Microsoft was less happy, but of course, that's uh, all different now, right? Um, I need to update this for Windows. Um, uh, I need to update this for Windows 7, right? Um, the the what's interesting is that the biggest difference between most of these pieces of software um, versions of Windows are actually the amount of memory that you want to have access to on your computer. There's um, a group of people who basically build in arbitrary memory limits. So if you have more than you know four or sixteen or thirty-two uh, 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 megabytes of Fit of uh, or gigabytes of, of physical memory in your machine, your system will uh, your, your version of Windows will just refuse to give you access. It will only it will only allow programs to access the first you know n n gigs of memory. Um, uh, but there's a whole bunch of other applications as well. This is the reason that I have this up there uh, instead of the uh, instead of the the Windows Seven is because of Windows Vista Starter, which should have been called Windows Vista Anti Feature Edition, and it's I think. 
um, uh, a really fabulous example. Starter could only run, could, had a series of additional anti-features. It could only run three graphical applications at a given time. So three user applications with a, with a graphical interface. It could only give you access to 250 gigabytes of disk space. Um, it had an arbitrary limit of uh, several gigabytes of memory, I think two gigabytes of memory. Um, and, 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 and all of these things were written in enormous code. Can you imagine being the engineer or the product manager whose job it is to manage the team of people who is going to develop the code to keep people from running more than three graphical applications? It's actually not trivial. I mean, imagine doing it, right? Like, you have to determine whether an application which is being launched is going to launch a graphical interface, if it is, or if it's just going to be in the taskbar or something like this. If it is going to launch a graphical application, you need to be able to sort of intervene, pop up a message for the user, explain to them that, that, uh, that, that they can't, that they've already run too many applications. And it's quite clear that no user ever asked for this. You know, this is a great piece of software. I just, I need to be able to run less, less applications. It all gets very cluttered. You know, just, just help me out, right? Um, um, the whole point of this was to counter work by one laptop per child and by, by basically free software more generally and sort of systems based on Linux kernels and systems in some cases using Debian, um, which, which in addition to allowing users to run, you know, as many applications as they liked, um, were, you know, were, were distributed at no cost. So the idea was they wanted to make a version of Windows that was cheap, like 20 bucks, maybe even less. And the idea was to make it so bad that anybody that could possibly afford a more expensive version of Windows would upgrade, right? That's market segmentation. Um, uh, uh, and this happens in all other sorts of places as well. This is, this is the, 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 the Canon G7. This is, I guess, now a, an increasingly older camera. But what's, what's cool about the G7 is that the G7, um, is that the G1 through the G6 had the ability to shoot raw photos. This is basically, um, raw photography is for the photographers here, you'll, you'll know, that being able to shoot raw on your camera means that you can uh, do some sort of more darkroom effects. It's kind of a nice, uh, a nice little trick, seen as sort of a more, a more advanced feature. But raw, of course, is just raw sensor data directly off the sensor in your camera, right? Which means that every time anyone takes a picture, you have a raw, you, you have a raw photograph, right? So, so Canon released a new version, the G8, the new version in the series, which was faster, had a bigger screen, was everything about it was sort of better, except that it didn't do raw. And the reason was because Canon was sort of realigning their product line and they wanted to, they, they decided that the G7, which was sort of previously seen as a more prosumer camera, they wanted to push those people up to the digital SLRs, you know, the, the, the Rebel. I mean, they, they, had some, they, they had some thinking that they wanted to push people to more expensive cameras and that raw was a feature that they could take away from certain cameras that would push people, that would, that, that would, that would push people um, to, to, the, to the more expensive products. And, and um, of course, it is, again, more difficult to compress a JPEG than it is to not compress a JPEG, right? Clear to people in this room, not as clear to many of the people that were buying these cameras, but clear enough to some people, um, uh, because I'm sorry, that's a little pixelated, because, um, be, because a number of people, quite annoyed by this, eventually went out there and found a way to write a piece of free software um, which would run in their cameras and which would allow them, um, including the G8 initially, and which would allow them to take raw photography among other things, right? And, and the point of this example and the point of mentioning CHDK, which is the Canon, Canon Hackers Dev Kit, which is this tool which, among many, many other things, now allows you to, to take raw photography. It sort of started out with the ability to take raw photography on your camera and then built in features to do things like, I mean, uh, zebra stepping, real-time histograms, you know, Games of chess, you know, all, all, all of the, all of the, all of the things you you you, you want to perhaps to show that is to show that that is show the other side of anti features, which is not only are these tempting and irresistible perhaps in the world of proprietary software, in a world of freedom they're not an, they're not an option and they are um, entirely unsustainable. The third class of anti features is is based around creating, extending, and anti and enforcing monopolies. Um, there's connections to all of these, um, and the the I think the best way is to jump in with an example, which is another camera example, um, which is related to the to I don't remember if people remember this, but but uh, uh, Panasonic sent an upgrade to their to their digital cameras out there, the firmware upgrade, and a number of people installed them on their cameras. And one notices that when they installed it on some of their cameras, the cameras just stopped working like altogether. The cameras wouldn't turn on. Because the firmware included the, included the ability to lock out third-party batteries. It turns out that they would notice if a battery was built by a third party, and if the battery was built by a third party, they just turned it, they just wouldn't restart the camera at all. Now we can vilify Panasonic here, and in fact I just did, 
Um, um, uh, but this practice is extremely widespread, and it's actually, there's even a name for it, and it's even an industry. It's called accessory control. This is, um, here's a quote from Ross Anderson's um, Security Engineering, which is a great book. Um, it says, it's common for the makers of game consoles to build in challenge response protocols to prevent software cartridges or other accessories from being uh, used with their product unless a license fee is paid. This practice is spreading. According to one vendor of authentication chips, some printer companies have begun to embed authentication in printers to ensure that genuine toner cartridges are used. If a competitor's product is loaded instead, the printer will quietly downgrade from 1200 DPI to 300 DPI. In mobile phones, much of the profit is made on batteries, and authentication protocols can be used to spot competitors' products so they can be drained more quickly. The story here is that Panasonic just screwed up. They turned the, they turned the camera off. Everyone else just turns the power-saving features off. Um, and, 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 oh yeah, these third-party batteries made from commodity cells ma produced in the same place, right? They never work as well. Um, Here's a, a press release from, uh, this is a press release from, from Atmel. So uh, TI was very proud of their battery authentication chips, um, uh, uh, which cost about 130 to the cost of the device. That's 130 to the cost of each battery. Every time you buy a $10 battery, 130, this is in costs in thousands, right? Goes into an authentication chip, which is designed to make other third party batteries work less well. Um, um, now, now, this is the Atmel's new one. They, they've halved the price, so it's now just under a dollar in, in quantity um, at cost. And this one is advertising the fact that they now have SHA-256 SHA on this, on this uh, uh, battery authentication chip because SHA-1 wasn't strong enough. Um, this is an arms race. It's an arms race being fought between, between, between the, the third-party battery manufacturers and the, 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 the main, the, the vendors of our, of, of our equipment. And, it's, and, and, the, and, it's in a, and, and the users are the casualties. We are the collateral damage, right? It's an attempt by manufacturers to eliminate user choice and control over their technology. It's trying to protect high margins that we all pay on the batteries themselves. And the software only, and, and, this, and this only works when, um, when users are helpless, divided, and entirely dependent. This basic idea of sort of secured, secured monopolies are what make it possible for, users, for, for companies to use loss leaders and many subscription-based services that users cannot leave, right? Printer cartridges introduce a very complicated authentication system with subject to you know, copyright cases in the US um, over copyright, it's like there are copyright arguments over the code which runs in the printer cartridges to keep other printer cartridges from working or working as well. Um, that that uh, uh, no US customer has, dem been, has, has demanded being barred from refilling their own printer cartridges or using one from a third party. And yet, we pay for it every time we buy a printer cartridge or a printer. We pay for the engineering effort for the, for the, for the hundreds of people that are involved in this, right? Game systems work the same way. We sell a cheap, cheap game system and we make up the loss on games. When the Xbox came out, this was particularly evident, right? The original Xbox, after all, was just a bunch of, you know, it was a bunch of PC components, right? It was, it was, it was, all, it looked a lot more like my laptop than it did like, like, like anything else, really. Um, and Microsoft invested an enormous amount of effort, hundreds of engineers, whose whose job it was to make the X, Xbox do less than its hardware could. Their job was to make to, was to make the Xbox less of a computer than it actually was, or less of a general purpose computer than it actually was. Um, namely, it was only supposed to play games licensed by Microsoft, um, and in particular. The Xbox was not supposed to run Debian, or at least not supposed to run GNU Linux more broadly. Um, and, and its inability to run GNU Linux was highly engineered and expensive. Um, um, TiVoization, right, this idea of locking down the, 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 so the device so that um, we can use GPL software but, or, or free software on the device, but then have basically encryption, which keeps users from being able to change the software on their device, is ex is, is, isn't free. It's the cost of the subscriptions, um, that, and we pay for it, and we cannot turn it off, right? And it's a good example of how um, a focus on licensing, I think, uh, misses some of the most important issues of autonomy and control, because access to the source code or the, the code under a free license doesn't mean that we actually have any more control over our devices. Now, um, uh, I've got one more class of anti-features, which is sort of based around protecting copyrights, and I put that in scare quotes because I think it is scary. Um, and it's also, of course, a, it's a subset, of course, of a type of protecting, it's protecting a particular type of, uh, type of monopoly, but it's so widespread um, that I think it warrants being singled out. And it's worth pointing out that copyright protection systems have been demanded by essentially no users and forced on almost all, except the people sitting in this room. Who remembers uh, this? 
Oh, a couple people, right? So it's a little hard to read, and that's because it's designed to be hard to read. That's the entire point. This is, the, this is part of the manual for SimCity. And this is uh, basically every time the game would start up, it would ask you to, what's the population, or what are the next to the city, or what are these little dots, and you'd have to sort of point them out here. And the idea, and then it was made with basically dark red on slightly less dark red paper, um, because it was designed to be impossible to photocopy. Um, it was basically just a copy protection thing, right? Um, if you remember this turn to page N in the manual and return the word X, you know, there's a whole bunch of examples. I've got some stuff on a, on a website on, the, uh, on these, right? The idea here is, I mean, these things aren't cheap to make. Someone had to think about them, someone had to go through and build these things, and then someone had to build the functionality into each game, which would make the game not start unless, uh, unless someone had implemented this. I don't know if anyone, people here have, must have had the misfortune of meeting a dongle. Right? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, there's no dongle fan club, I like to say, right? Um, uh, these are physical, like, physical things that you plug into your computer, which a piece of software will not start unless this, uh, unless this physical object with some sort of crypto on it, it, it is present in the computer, right? Um, and people are paying to engineer and build these things, right? They're often very significant portions of the cost of our technology, right? And, here's, and, and, and what they're doing is they're fighting an important reality that we and very few people outside of this room have embraced, which is the reality that we all have copying machines on our desks, great, wonderful, general purpose copying machines. I mean, better than any produced ever before. Um, and uh, we're on our laps, I suppose. Um, and it's depressing, but one of the greatest engineering process, uh, problems of the 21st century has been making these perfect copying machines less good at copying things. My uh, uh, colleague at the Electronic Frontier Foundation estimates that there are several tens of thousands of people who are employed in the sort of broader, uh, broader copy protection industry, building systems that quite clearly no user has ever asked for. Um, now I could, I could give an entire talk about anti-features and DVDs, um, um, and there's a sense in which I don't really know how to start. I could talk about region coding, I could talk about encryption, I could talk about watermarking, um, uh, all anti-features, none of which have a fan club like dongles. Um, but there's one that I just want to single out right here because it annoys me so much, which is that unskippable track at the beginning of every DVD, right? How many thousands of days, how many years, hundreds of years of human life have been wasted by people watching that unskippable track at the beginning of the DVD and pressing forward and having their DVD player not respond? Um, I have not met a free software DVD player that honored that unskippable track. Someone told me there is one, but I've not found it. Um, um, but there is hope um, uh, after that depressing uh, little talk. And the hope is because, uh, and there is hope because in, in free software, because, because, um, because the freedom to modify software in any way, a freedom enshrined in our Debian free software guidelines and in our social contract is the freedom to remove functionality that users don't want. And the freedom to share software or collaborate is the freedom to work together to work around predatory practices inflicted on us. Because we have freedom, most anti-features are impossible, or at least they are the low-hanging fruit for free software. Because as developers, all we need to do is not build something for our users to get something, to not get something they don't want, if that makes sense. Um, 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 which version of Debian do I want, right? Well, let's see, how much memory do I have in my computer, right? How many applications do I want to run, right? If my answers to those questions matter, how long do we think it would take before, um, de before Debian was forked by someone who offered the ability to not choose? And we all know the answer, right? No time at all. Now, um, I wanted to end by talking a little bit about what I see as four important uh, uh, areas for free software, many of which Debian is involved, uh, involved in with. And those three are mobile phones, network services, and uh, DRM. Um, uh, and the way that anti-features sort of are a way of thinking about and talking about each of these issues. So, um, uh, uh, this, if people recognize this, is a, is a, a SIM unlocker. It's a little thing you can uh, put, in your, put in your phone with a SIM card and have, the, uh, and have your phone run an unlocked SIM. Um, mobile phones are the most widely distributed form of powerful computers, and they are the least likely to act like a computer because they are almost universally locked down to a degree which should seem extraordinary to people and unacceptable to people in this room, and that we essentially, even us, essentially take for granted. 
Um, this uh, SIM unlocker lets users defeat an uh, anti feature which is designed to keep their phone from working with arbitrary SIM cards because a large number of phones are sold worldwide locked to a particular character. This is basically a sort of an, an enforcing a monopoly anti feature. But I don't need to tell you about locked phones because despite the fact that everyone in this room hates it, and most of us have probably had to deal with it, it's something that we've all come to expect. Um, and we all just seem to take it, right? If this were a more general audience, I'd ask how many of you have root on your phone. I'll ask how many of you have root on your phone. Like uh, uh, some people, but maybe less than half, maybe a third, right? Um, and suffice it to say that if I did this in most other rooms, there would be less people who put their hand up, right? Cryptographic systems prevent the installation of unapproved or unsigned images and uh, is an expensive anti feature, which is included in the prices of almost every phone sold worldwide and which we all just pay. Um, Let's see. Um, do I have a one here? Yeah. So, so, so this is this is this is the an old version here. But even the best examples of free software friendly phones, anti features are unclear, uh, are quite clear, right? This is the this is the, these phones look similar. This is the G1, the first Android phone. This is the version that is the the developer phone, and this is the version that is not the developer phone. And um, uh, basically, they come in the, the, these two two versions. The version that is locked to a carrier is cheaper. When it went on sale, it cost uh, about two hundred dollars. This version, which is not locked to a carrier, costs four hundred and twenty-five dollars, um, and uh, lets you install arbitrary operating system images. Right? That two two hundred and twenty-two dollars is the difference between those two prices, those two phones, and that two hundred and twenty-two dollars is the freedom tax. Um, and uh, I paid it. Um, I paid the freedom tax. Um, I got what I got was a phone. What I got was a phone without a key ring on it. That's it. I mean, it was missing. It was missing a couple of files. Um, uh, and I got a statement that, uh, and, and, and I guess and there was also an if statement in the bootloader that would check for it. So, um, uh, uh, so, so, so very little. And I'm happy to pay it. I'm happy to pay that 200 bucks because for me it's worth it. It's the cost of removing an anti feature is what I'm willing to pay because I, um, because I think in those terms, right? But most people don't. Anti features are what we um, are what mean we're all carrying around computers with microphones, with cameras, with sensors, and that we trust with our closest secrets and our most sensitive data, and in almost all cases, these computers remain controlled completely and ultimately by companies that very few of us trust at all. Um, if we can communicate about anti-features as anti-features, right, we might be able to build real support around a free phone alternative um, where those anti-features become impossible. Um, you know, poor OpenMoco didn't do a lot of things, but the fact that it didn't do some of those things was pretty great. Uh, this is the... Uh, this is the, uh, 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 moving on to network services. Um, this is sort of the second area I wanted to talk about. This is the GitHub list of subscription prices. And it's a combination of uh, sort of subscription enforced monopoly model with a market segmentation model. And it's like, a, this is like a menu of anti-features, right? The more, the more you pay, the less anti-features you get is basically the idea here, right? Um, um, it doesn't cost GitHub. I mean, some of the difference between some of these is how many repositories you want. I mean, people in this room know exactly how much it costs to run an extra Git repository on a system, right? Not once you're once you're running one or two, not very much, especially um, if you're not having a space difference as well. What's the going price of a row on a MySQL table? How much is a, how much does a row cost? You know, to run, I don't know, about a dollar a month, according to this. Um, um, and the reason I post this is to remind us that in network services, access to code is no longer the central issue. What matters is autonomy and control of the network services, and the service provider has that, even if. In the case of Git, for example, although not in the case of the GitHub infrastructure, we have, um, uh, we, we have control of the code. Um, GitHub's entire systems, right, the legal and the technical systems, was crafted in immense effort and expense. Their billing systems, right, their, the, um, the, the monitoring systems, the thing that notices when you haven't paid your bills and disables your accounts, right? These are um, the sets of roles and the system to enforce it, right? The software that detects if you've created too many accounts and disables your access when your bill hasn't been paid. All of these things are created in enormous effort and they're actually a significant part of what GitHub, uh, of the value that GitHub is, is bringing us and nobody wants it. Um, but of course, there are options as well. Gatorius is a free software replacement for GitHub. I'm sure people here um, know about it. Um, I mean, uh, uh, it doesn't have 100% of the features that GitHub does, but it is missing 100% of the anti features that GitHub contains. Um, and as a result, it has an inherent advantage when it, it, it had an inherent advantage over GitHub when it did next to nothing. Incomplete, sure, but inherent. And the reason I'm using these examples is because I think these are generic problems of hosted or non-free network services. Anti-features give us a way to understand the harm that they do and a way to reflect on the fact that these services systematically disadvantage users and what we might do about them. And in the, this is a sort of 
designed it free software developers, which this GitHub is, at least partially. I mean, they, they make it easy for, for, for us to use it. It's something that I think is important to think about. Um, this is my final example, um, uh, DRM. You can order the shirt from the Free Software Foundation. Um, um, despite victories in the area of music, DRM continues to be a major threat to free software and video in software and in, and in embedded systems. Um, and I think that DRM, in, in one sense, can be seen as like the mother of all anti-features. Um, nobody wants them. Um, there's this industry of, as I said, you know, tens of thousands of people working on technologies that users hate. And it's an Etsy feature that has already been the, down, the, the, the downfall of DRM, although not down enough yet. Here is a, uh, I picked this up at a, um, this is a little advertisement I picked up at a, a cafe across the street from my house. And despite the fact that I live in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, it's not like a geek cafe, it's like a normal cafe full of like normal, non, like normal non-technical people. Um, advertising, uh, this, is, this is a little, this is, this is a couple years ago when, D, when before all music was essentially DRM music. But, this is, but, but here's a company who's, I mean, Calabash Music has printed DRM free, almost bigger than the name of their own site. Right? Like the fact that their music doesn't have DRM is one of them, is, is seen for these people as one of the major selling points. They're advertising code that they have not written. <laughs> They're advertising features that they are not going to push on users. Um, and, 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 and we don't have to uh, look any further because, it, because DRM was, uh, you know, to, to, to see this sort of freedom tax, right? I um, mean, to see the, the degree of the anti features. It used to be when, when DRM and music was beginning to fail. Um, uh, Apple would offer in their music store the DRM version or the non-DRM version. The DRM version cost $1 and the non-DRM version cost $1.50. That's the cost of freedom. Um, uh, that's the premium freedom. That's, that's, that's Sony and the fresh start crapware removal system, right? So um, I can end, uh, I can end where, where, where I began, which is to say that in a perfect software development world, even when things work perfectly, what software developers want is simply not always what users want. And that's just the reality. Um, Anti-features is the most extreme example of this, and as I hope I've shown, a nice way to talk about some of the key issues in free software. Free software eliminates anti-features and ensures that we are closer in alignment between the interests of developers and users. This is an inherent advantage and part of the reason that free software will win. Thanks for listening, and uh, thanks for putting on such a great conference. Yeah, sure, a few questions, yeah. Sorry, uh, uh, I'm Daniel, DKG. I had a question about uh, the framing it as a, the freedom tax or the extra price. Um, I wonder if that won't at some point become uh, counterproductive in that if we make it clear to people, hey look, this is your choice. Either you've got an extra $225 um, and so you can buy your freedom or those of you who don't have $225 to spend on such luxuries as freedom are gonna, hmm. um, well, suck it up. You aren't free, right? Are we, are we, are we putting it all back into sort of uh, uh, how you know how much freedom can you buy? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that I think that in the in the sense that it, as we build as we build systems which are compelling and co compelling compelling free alternatives, um, they tend to be priced lower as well. Um, so I think that that. Um, I mean, we've already seen in lots and lots of places people making decisions to move to free systems because the free systems do everything that they want, maybe more, um, and, and are also cheaper. Um, in part because the, the firms can't, in, 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 in the presence of a free alternative or a free competitor, they can't charge the monopoly rents. So I think that in the long term, I mean, so maybe freedom tax is a better term because people don't like taxes. Um, uh, and it sort of makes it clear that it is a, it is a rent that's being charged. Not, uh, uh, not, not something that anyone is justified in doing, because I think that they are ju unjustified in doing it. I mean, I, I mean you're right. The point, the point here is to, is, to, is to point out the, the injustice of this. Um, and it's true that you can buy your way out of injustice in lots and lots of places. Um, that's a, that's a, 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 a crappy reality of the world, and it's one that I think we should be offended by in this space and in many other spaces. Um, and uh, uh, I'll, I'll try to be more explicit about my disgust uh, when I frame this in the future. That's a great, that's a great, great feedback. Hi, uh, Colin, CJ Wilson. 
Uh, one thing I've noticed is that users feel really good about removing anti-features. You know, you pe people talk about, hey, I reinstalled my Windows system and, you know, suddenly it's much faster. And they feel, they feel kind of a sense of success in uh, this easy improvement that can be made to the systems that they run. And, you know, obviously you can get the same kind of thing from free software systems and people do take vast amounts of pride in the customizations that they've been able to make. But it's harder, it's, um, it's often a sort of geekier kind of thing. Um, how can we make it just as easy? Do you have any thoughts on how we can make it just as easy for people to feel that same kind of uh, success and pride, but without having to suffer the pain of the anti-feature in hmm, the first that's place? A good, that's, a great, that's a great question. So I think that... that <laughs> So there's a degree of just like antagonism. People, there's a, there's, a, there's a subset of people who just like love hacking the iPhone because, not because they particularly hate Apple, although maybe they do, but just because they like the, they like, you know, for the same reason people like fighting, you know? Um, I mean, you're, you're seeing a little bit of my bias towards some of these communities. Uh, uh, but there's this like, there's a bit of this sort of m macho thing that we see in some geek communities. Um, uh, uh, and uh, and and which and which is about you know like sort of defeating other people's systems or building systems that they can't defeat and I think people I think people enjoy that and so what's interesting is so 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 one answer is is that I think anti features are not I mean I, I didn't mention this but one of the when I, I gave this talk I gave this talk a couple times before and the first time someone or someone said what about anti features in free software like do you think that they could exist and um, I thought about it and I think the answer is yes I can think of a couple. Um, um, or, or at least complicated examples where some users want something but others, others don't and they make it very hard for them to remove. One would be anti-cheating anti systems in games, um, um, which very often look a lot like DRM systems. Um, there's, a GPL, there's a piece of GPL software, I forget the name of the game, but which they, they, they want to basically authenticate clients to make sure that they're very particular, that, that there's one piece of software which is, which is interacting with the network because they don't want people to run hack clients and cheat, and people like to defeat those, so I don't know if that's part of the answer. But uh, um, that's, 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 one, that's, that's one suggestion. The other thing is, is that sometimes people, some, th there's a group of people who want to make it like very difficult for people to run non-free software on their system, which is something that a lot of users don't d don't want, and be like very proactive in terms of blocking people from running non-free software. I think that those probably fall into the category of anti-features, at least for a large number of users. Um, that's my that's my that's my intuition. Um, I mean, in terms of the antagonism, I'm not sure. I think that that if you look, there are a small subset of people who are interested in hacking the iPhone, but I think that they're actually reasonably small compared to the number, of the 25% of people who actually did hack their iPhone, who were just doing it because they, they wanted to run some of the cool apps that people had built, or they wanted to run it with a carrier other than the one, they, they, the, the, than the one that they had bought the phone from. Um, so, uh, I mean, it's an interesting motivational question, and I'm, uh, I, I, I'm, I, do, I don't know how important it is, uh, but but uh, I think that that if we had the problem that we'd eliminated anti features and people were less motivated to uh, contribute to some of our projects, or some people were, I think I uh, that would be a great problem to have, uh, and I look forward to I look forward to struggling it when we get there. Hi, I'm Ashish Paul Pradesh. Uh, so I'm not sure I'm going to phrase this entirely the way I want to, but I think that for a lot of users, not having choice is a feature. Uh, simplicity means you don't spend your time deciding things. So if Microsoft, for the Xbox, for example, said, uh, we're going to sell you a PC in the shape of uh, an Xbox, and you can plug in whatever you want, and here are some things that we think you can plug in, I actually think it might have sold less than if they were really clear about, this is a game console, it will only ever run games, and we've done our best to make sure that no game can ruin the experience of a different game. Sure. So, so there's a difference between affordances um, in technologies and anti-features, I guess. Every technology is going to be easier to do things. So, so I mean, look at my, uh, whoops. I mean, we can go back to our, our, our list of versions of Windows, right? There's, this is not a lack of choice, right? Um, uh, uh, there's plenty of choice, right? All of the choices are bad. But, uh, uh, but, but, there's, but, but there's certainly a lack of choice. And every technology is going to have affordances. My phone is going to have the ability to send, is going to come out of the box and the ability to communicate in certain ways. When I install Debian on my system, it comes, uh, you know, has the ability to work in particular ways. Many of them are, are buggy. Um, uh, but, but, uh, 
And many of them I want to change, and many of them I do change. Um, but but uh, most software I don't modify, and most stuff I use basically with the affordances that it has. So I think that, that I think that that's setting up a little bit of a, a, a false a false tension. All software is going to have affordances, and it's going to work in particular ways. Um, and there's a difference between saying, um, you know, uh, maybe people even want the DRM system to keep software from 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 attacking them, you know, from people's writing viruses and getting on your computer. One nice thing about a, sort of a, a very comprehensive DRM system is that viruses would presumably be less common. Although whether or not that's true, I don't know. But but le let's say we believe the hype. In that case, why not install a button on the side of my computer which says, or, or even a jumper inside my computer, that if I want to, I can flip it. That's a feature. Um, uh, uh, and, that, and in some sense, the ability to turn that off um, renders that anti feature less, less important. Um, it's, it's, I mean, it's an, it's an interesting model. So, all right, well, thank you, everyone. I think the time's up. So, thank you very much, Shimra.